50 years, well why would we mark 50 years of planning? Well, as you all know, um, the 1964 planning law came into force um, in 1965, um, but we thought it would be a really good point at which to sort of look back over those 50 years with a bit of practical experience and reflect upon the contribution of the law to our island. Um, we can all look at uh, developments we know, some we like, some we don't, um, but the impact upon those uh, on the coastline and the countryside and preservation of heritage, provision of infrastructure and homes and the like. Um, and of course, another important factor is the quality of building construction which has changed over those 50 years. So we're marking it with a, a series of events this year uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. But I thought it might be interesting to go back before 1965 and see what was um, around it before those 50 years of control. Uh, because there was very limited control. Um, there was some public health legislation uh, in 1934, uh, and uh, there was a, a groundswell of concern, I think, among some prominent islanders, uh, which culminated in the formation of the National Trust for Jersey in 1936. Um, there were various attempts post war to introduce preservation of amenities law, but these uh, had very little teeth and had very little control. Um, and uh, even the 1952 um, preservation of amenities works, uh, although they contained plan making powers, uh, there were no plans actually made um, until 1963. So um, we had a very timid approach, I think, to control in Jersey. Um, most of it was uh, around public health legislation. We did not benefit, uh, if benefit is the right word, but we did not experience the legislative bonanza of post-war laws which came through in the UK. Those of you who know your social history will know about the wholesale nationalisation of industry, the establishment of the NHS and the welfare state. Uh, town and country planning sailed in on the coattails of that in 1947 in the UK in this big post-war um, bid for legislation. Perhaps the UK and Jersey were experiencing different needs at the time. Certainly Jersey's um, uh, needs following the occupation were probably different to the post-war um, post construction in the UK. Um, but uh, we did have a set of building bylaws in 1960. Uh, but these were rooted, as I said, in public health legislation, and they were really based on the 1930 uh, Code for Building in the UK. Um, so the focus was very much on health standards and very little to do with location, preservation of public amenity. Um, and during that time, of course, Jersey had seen quite a lot of ribbon development along the south coast. Those of you who know, obviously, the strip from around St. Bernard's, around uh, St. Edmunds Bay, and across to the south coast of Grooville. Uh, we know of the uh, ribbon development which we experienced and of course the bungalow rush that I'm calling it uh, across the island bu buildings being built in the corner of fields um, and this was a, a huge concern I think to people at the time and they really felt that the character of the island would be harmed um, if building were allowed to continue in this ma manner. I think probably Islanders biggest fear was that something like that would happen. <laughs> 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 so, prior to 1965, we had seen the formation of uh, what became known as the Comité de Berté Naturel, uh, which began to consider applications for building work under those preservation of amenity regulations I mentioned earlier. Uh, and they worked together, though, importantly, I think, to bring the various regulations together, which culminated in the 1964 Island Planning Law, which, as I said, came into force in 65. Um, and within that was embedded Jersey's first development plan. Um, some of you may remember the Barrett plan. It was the first development plan and the first introduction of any form of concept in Jersey that you couldn't build exactly what you wanted to, wherever you wanted to. It was the first, it was the start of zonal planning, the introduction of the use of the green zone, and this idea that land could be protected from development. Um, fortunately, one of the things you do when you research a tool like this is you look back for, um, for photographs. And uh, I was fortunate enough to find a, an old photograph of the, um, the comité. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, and, um, and the president of the day. And, uh, and so, which, which led me to go on and look back and say, well, well think about what is the planning law ever done for us? Well, I think the first planning law, uh, the 65 law, was really the, the, you know, this, this benchmark and it began to introduce this concept 
the legal requirement to obtain permission to develop land. Uh, of course, the principles of the law were set out and very strongly uh, around the protection of the coast and the countryside um, from development. So there were clear aims set out in the first in the Article 2 of the law. Um, safeguarding sensitive sites was a clear um, uh, object as well. Uh, protection of heritage, uh, protection of trees through tree preservation orders, and things like ecology through uh, sites of special interests. Um, in the 60s, I think uh, the importation of caravans is clearly an issue, although I don't recall it, but um, difficult to believe today maybe, but uh, there was control put in over importation of uh, caravans. And I think there had also been quite a lot of um, uh, dumping around and areas, sensitive areas, particularly in St. Juan's Bay is the one that's often spoken about, uh, <coughs> where there had been dumping taking place. And uh, this is on important sites, and clearly there needs to be controls over that as well. So the law um, also introduced other um, supplementary um, legislation, such as um, advertisement control, uh, general development control, and movable structures. Uh, and all of this was achieved in 25 pages, because I counted them yesterday, 25 pages of A5. Uh, it wasn't that closely typed either. So all of those things that I've just talked about in a very small amount of legislation. And really, that really led to uh, certain achievements, I believe, as Paul mentioned in his brief introduction. Um, you know, areas which were cleaned up quite significantly um, over the period that the law's been in power. And don't forget that law was in power for 40 years, from 1965 to about 2006, so 41 years. Uh, and it saw lots of achievements. Uh, the Blanche Banque, for instance, protected as a site of special interest. I mean, an internationally uh, uh, important site, this. Um, you know, I, I've heard stories from my father's, uh, you know, recounted to me of people who used to drive around the sand dunes in cars just for a laugh, you know. And uh, you, you wouldn't even dream of doing that today. Well, uh, <laughs> some, some, some 